not surprisingly at all, that was a fabulous panel. Uh, wonderful panelists and super well moderated by Peter. Thank you. Um, you know, one, one uh, item I'd like to underscore there that uh, applies not just to trials in India, but trials outside the, the United States is one of the observations I've had coming from pharma back into the biotech industry is there is a relative over-indexing on the, on the United States in general within biotech companies. And, um, you know, as I've said to many teams over many years, the vast majority, in fact, 95% of uh, sick people are outside the United States. The, the markets are far more uh, attractive and kind of in flux right now that are ex-US than ever before. And there's a slope there that's pretty impressive. And so uh, whether it's India or generally the, the world outside the United States, it's super important to think that through early in clinical development and even late in research. Um, the next panel, I'm going to be very pleased to introduce Bill Chin, uh, Emeritus Professor at Harvard and, and well known to all of you here with a pretty illustrious career crossing academia and industry, um, to talk about two very large topics in neuroscience and rare disease. Uh, these don't necessarily have to go together, of course. They each represent uh, a large volume of people that are uh, ill and in need. Um, and both of them have challenges that are, are different from one another. With um, the brain, obviously, and all disease that happens in the brain, there is a barrier between uh, systemic and brain compartments, and that often is part of the challenge, in addition to understanding the diseases, uh, uh, so an additional challenge. And with rare diseases, rare diseases are rare, and often, in addition to the challenges of understanding the disease, um, there's the problem of finding patients and uh, problems of finding patients both during clinical trials and uh, during the commercial phase of a product, locating them. Uh, not, all, uh, not all rare diseases are diagnosable uh, genetically. So these are, are particularly big areas. So with that, can I um, welcome uh, Bill? And uh, Bill will welcome uh, another fantastic panel. Can I have the uh, panelists of? Very good, Priya. Come. Good to good to meet you. Good morning, everybody. I am not Timothy Yu. Um, I'm a bit younger than Timothy. A little laugh there. Um, I was conscripted uh, very uh, late last night to help out uh, because, because Timothy couldn't make it on, on, on short notice. So it's my pleasure to help with this panel. I'm going to do my best uh, to, to try to do this justice. Peter, you did a great, great, great job. Um, so I'm going to introduce the panel very briefly. I wonder if one or two of the panels might be able to describe their, their companies a little bit more because I'm not sure everybody knows, know, knows about them. So uh, maybe we'll start with, uh, we'll just go down the line. David, I know you well, David. Uh, so uh, he's the chairman and CEO of uh, Rhythm Pharmaceuticals. You want to say a word about Rhythm? Yeah, we're a small company uh, working in quote unquote rare diseases, but uh, the patient population we're uh, pursuing is presents with obesity. So we're kind of lost in this very large obesity space, but it's a rare disease. And our biggest challenge is helping the world understand that, yes, obesity may be a disease, but it's not one disease. It's many diseases. And uh, the challenge is to sort it out. And we face all of the challenge that I'm sure we're going to discuss um, that uh, rare disease patients face. Thank you, Priya. Good morning, everyone. Delighted to be here with all of you. I'm Priya Singhal. I'm the head of development at Biogen. And I hope Biogen does not need an introduction in the Cambridge, Massachusetts area, at least. Uh, we are the oldest independent biotechnology company. We've been focused on neuroscience, rare disease, immunology, and a lot, a lot more. So very excited uh, to be here today. It also happens to be the one-year anniversary of the approval of tofersin or qualsodi for a rare disease, a rare genetic form of ALS. So very exciting time. 
Thank you, Priya. Thank you. Jim? So, yeah, my name's Jim Wilson, and I work for University of Pennsylvania, Inc. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so uh, I've uh, been a professor there for 33 years, interested in gene therapy and genetic diseases from my initial clinical training and run the Orphan Disease Center, but have founded eight biotech companies around uh, gene therapy and editing for rare diseases. Hi, my name is Edward Kay, and I'm CEO at Soak Therapeutics, which is located uh, here in Bedford and, and offices here in Kendall Square. So we're a company that is focused on targeted genetic therapies, and we're very interested in rare diseases, especially neurologic diseases. Our focus is upregulating protein production by changing splicing in RNA. Um, and, and, you know, I started out with David at Genzyme, and I worked with Jim at, uh, uh, at you, looking at gene therapy at, uh, at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, and Josh, too. Uh, and and what, what we realize is, is there are a lot of diseases that are challenging to get at. And some of these are autosomal dominant diseases where you're missing 50% of the protein. And a lot of genetic diseases, epilepsies, developmental disorders. So what we found is if you s basically remove some of the retained elements on pre-messenger RNA, you can increase the amount of full-length message and increase protein. So we're focused on replacing, getting that missing protein back up to 100% and really trying to address a lot of diseases uh, that to date have not been targeted. And so we're excited about trying to go after diseases with a new modality uh, uh, to try to improve patients, especially with rare neurologic diseases. Thanks, Ed. Hi, I'm Josh Mendelbrim. I'm the CEO of Camp 4 Therapeutics. Uh, Camp 4 is using antisense oligonucleotides to also upregulate genes to put more protein in the system. Ed gave a very nice introduction to that. Um, I will say I've intersected most people on this panel, but in my sort of earlier years, and I'm used to being um, not the smartest one in the room, but this is particularly acute for me being on this panel. So, um, and Karun asked us to be really positive, so maybe I could just start by saying there's an incredible amount of innovation that's happened by all the people left to me on this panel, and I actually think it's worth a moment just pointing that out in terms of David's company has a new drug for genetic obesity. Biogen continues to be a leader, and, and Tofersen's just one example of that. Jim is the nucleation point for gene therapy, which is just... I mean, the last 10, 20 years have been incredible, and, and Ed just put out incredible data for a disease that needs disease-modifying therapies in Gervais syndrome. So I think this is, Corinne, was that positive enough to start us? So um, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, look forward to the discussion. Th thank, thank you, Josh. Um, you want to be the moderator? You, uh, you did this pretty well. Yes, actually, that would be a lot easier for me. <laughs> you took away all my introductory remarks. Um, Indeed, you're correct. Um, the progress in rare and ultra-rare diseases has been tremendous over the past two or three decades. I remember uh, when I first interacted with Genzyme. Uh, David, you were there, um, you know, almost, almost three decades ago, thinking about, or more, about enzyme replacement um, and how that was dealing with rare diseases. And the struggles that you and others had in terms of uh, the whole issue of, of payers and payment, et cetera, et cetera. But the point was that you met an incredible unmet medical need uh, for those patients and families who, uh, patients who suffered from, from those diseases. And so fast forward, you know, we, we have made incredible progress. So you think about the science that has progressed from cell to gene, and I include RNA therapies to CRISPR, um, um, and, and, and so forth. We've done amazing jobs. And so there are many, many patients who owe their, their, their lives. Uh, certainly uh, less pain and suffering. Uh, families who now enjoy their company uh, uh, that they, they couldn't have imagined uh, many years ago. I think we, we often should pause to, and we don't do it enough, to, to, to trumpet. Those, those successes. And it's due to companies like, like these, uh, including uh, Penn Inc., uh, uh, to, to have really fostered this, this development. Um, but then again, there are still challenges, okay? 
And so what we'd like to do is just spend a few more moments uh, talking about some of the successes um, and then talk about some of the challenges. Um, we know there was a recent voluntary withdrawal of, of a drug for a rare disease. Um, you know, for some that, that sort of a, puts a little paw on, on everything, but, but that shouldn't be because this is the nature of our business. Um, we, we do our best and, and often we have good medicine. Sometimes, uh, you know, it doesn't necessarily be true, but that, that's the way we, we, we operate. So I wanna go through the panelists here and just ask them first, um, what do you think has been a recent success that you know, maybe, maybe outside your own company that, that might, we might want to reflect on as a, as a good story for us to begin with? David? <clears throat> well, I can go back to Ed, but I won't steal Ed's thunder, so uh, <laughs> he can talk about that. I think that's remarkable. But um, ultragenics, so Angelman syndrome. Rare neurologic disorder, gene therapy, I'd love to get Jim's thoughts on that, not gene therapy, sorry, in a sense, but um, in that uh, modifying realm. But it's an example, rare diseases, um, you know, Bill highlighted uh, Genzyme and, you know, enzyme replacement therapies, and, you know, at one level, of course, that was groundbreaking, and uh, groundbreaking in many ways, scientifically to a certain extent, business model to another, just in terms of how a rare diseases communities get built. Those are really low-hanging fruit. I mean, in a sense, the science couldn't have been more simple. I mean, you're missing an enzyme, you replace it. Fortunately, it was safe, and, and you know, it just worked. And the, and the world rallied around and, and embraced that moment. I, I think, you know, now we're confronting not the low-hanging fruit, the much more challenging elements of different rare diseases, many of which are neurologic, with all the associated challenges. And what of doing clinical trials in that group, what are the biomarkers? I mean, if you can reverse something, of course, that's a very easy trial to run. If you can just slow the progression, that's a very difficult trial to run. And then rare diseases, if you don't have a lot of people, and showing that statistically comes almost impossible. So Angelman's, again, a rare neurologic disease, they showed what looks to be a very clear slowing, maybe reversal, in some of those aspects of the neurologic presentation. So for me, I thought that was really a remarkable example. And we'll see where the regulators go, because they're going to have all the other challenges of small patient numbers. They saw it in a few, few patients. Is that going to translate to a larger group? And anyway, I'll, I'll stop there. But that was for me a Priya, example. thank you, David. You know, I think it's very rare that you come across a coming together of several aspects in the ecosystem that are so critical for drug development. And I think that's the movement, that's the innovation we are seeing today. Because, you know, back in the 80s, there were about 5% of all new molecular entities directed towards rare disease. Now it's 43%. And I don't think it's a coincidence. I think it's because of the advancements in biology, the genomic sequencing that does not cost billions of dollars, it's $1,000 as of today, and there's just so much more work on natural history, biomarkers, endpoints, and regulatory flexibility. So it's about us finding the gems where we can triangulate all these aspects and land on a benefit for a patient. And I think that's what I'm really excited about because I think it's the decade for patients who've been sort of ignored because we haven't had that coming together. And now we do. I think Angelman's is a great example. Very excited about the data that Ultragenics showed. We also have our own readout coming later on. Very excited about this. One example I would like to bring up is the example where it was Riata, the company we acquired as Biogen last year. They did something quite unusual because they had a rare disease, Friedrich's ataxia. They were asked to provide more data by the FDA. This is all in the public domain and you've probably read it. What was really crucial here is that if it was just up to Riata, this was not a possible. But they had the support of the Frederick's Ataxia Research Alliance of Farah, which had been collecting natural history for 20 years. And because they had that, they were able to do a very unbiased propensity matched analysis and demonstrate durability, so not just confirmation, but durability out to three years. And I thought that that was the beauty of being able to leverage the drug development ecosystem. And I think it's a great story. 
Thank you. Jim? So I, I um, you know, many of the same issues that you brought up um, we've been experiencing, but, um, but you know, I'll, I'll sort of make a point from a cl clinical perspective. Um, when I started at the University of Michigan uh, in the division of genetics with Francis Collins in my division, um, and we went to clinic, uh, we could diagnose. And, and, and what we would say is, uh, the good news is we now understand why your child has this disease. It's due to this mutation in this gene. Uh, take your child home and make the best of the time. And clinical genetics was, was for decades a diagnostic um, discipline. Um, but, but, but now that's different and it's changing. And I think Genzyme really was on the cutting edge of that. Um, but, I, but I would, what I'm worried about uh, as to uh, sort of the paradox of what we can do and what we can afford to do is, is the conversation that we may have in the clinic that your child has this disease. There actually are clinical data uh, for genetic medicines that could potentially help them, but we can't afford to bring them forward. That's a different paradox, and, and I don't think, uh, and, I, and I, I think we have to find ways to try to move these, uh, these genetic therapies forward, because through the incredible investment when things were frothy, uh, in the biotech industry, there was enormous progress made on multiple fronts on multiple genetic diseases showing really remarkable data in the clinic. But as Mattia had said earlier, in terms of these micro cycles, definitely in terms of rare diseases over the last year or two, we are in a cycle where the actual and the perceived support for developing products for rare diseases is in a downturn. And the patients are uh, really upset about it. Jim, uh, but what excites you of anything that happened over the last year or two? Perhaps you could... Sure. Um, well, the year or two, let's think about it. A gene therapy for hemophilia A. A gene therapy for hemophilia B. A gene therapy for Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. Right. And a gene editing for sickle. I mean, and earlier in our career, had, we sort of thought about it and dreamed about it. That was in over a two-year period. Remarkable. Yeah. Remarkable opportunities creates enormous challenges, though. I mean, just think about these diseases. You know, all, some of us are physicians in the audience. I mean, think about growing up and, and, and learning about these diseases that were never going to be treatable, right? And somehow, you know, through the years, we've been able to do it. I think it's, it's just absolutely remarkable. So, well, 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 the other way that I think about it, we, uh, some, Stelios and others were here. We, we convened last September uh, at Cold Spring Harbor to celebrate 50 years since mm. the discovery of recombinant DNA. Yeah, yeah. And whoever was still around, alive <laughs> at the time, was there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, but, it, but it, was, it was quite an experience. And then, and then to reflect on the enormous investment uh, yeah. uh, since that time and sort of where we are. And, and we'll talk about this whole issue of investment or maybe potential declines in investment in this area, which uh, can be worrisome. Ed? Yeah, I think um, w one of the things that um, I think have, uh, gets me excited is how we continue to learn from, from each other and continue to evolve what we think about, especially rare and neurologic diseases. So um, you know, when we went after Dravé syndrome, the, the whole focus was um, you have to stop the seizures. And, and then, but you, which if you realize, then we looked at the natural history. These kids were on four or five, six or seven drugs. They still had seizures. And what about the rest of the disease? The fact that they have these severe cognition and behavioral problems and it's not being addressed. So the idea was, can you go after the underlying genetic cause and can you try to correct it? And um, so one of the things we had to figure out, how do you get into the, the brain? Well, what we learned from Biogen is let's do an intrathecal injection and let's see if that gets in. And, and I think we learned from that. And you know, we talked about Angelman syndrome. I was on the phone with Emil and asking him, what are you guys doing in, in uh, Angelman and how can we use that for Dravet syndrome? And then you know, when we just recently announced our data, we saw not only an 80% improvement in seizures, 
But these kids were actually improvement on um, cognition and behavior. We're talking about 17 and 18 year old children who were thought to be profoundly retarded, could never get it better, and suddenly they're actually getting better. Well, that suggests that you know, this is a new era, and we're going after things like Rett syndrome and Angelman's that we thought would never improve. These are developmental disorders, and now we're realizing we're understanding the science better, and we're learning from our patients that we can make them better. So that's an exciting area that I think that at least I as a clinician would have never thought that we could get to this place at this time, but we are. Thank you, Ed. Josh, your, your example? Um, yeah, so I was listening to what the panels were saying. I, I think we're all in the business ultimately of making drugs, and so I think about it in terms of breakthroughs, and breakthroughs in the form of either um, new modality or new technology is de-risked from the point of view that people see it as a viable therapeutic for patients, or the approval of something new where there wasn't that before. And so uh, Jim alluded to a couple examples of that. A few more I was thinking about were, uh, for example, dynanavidity, showing that you could deliver oligos or siRNA conjugated to the muscle. Um, Ed's example of being able to upregulate in these genetic diseases and have a transformative effect. There are hundreds of those diseases, right? And so that is actually a massive shift. Um, the first, uh, cell therapy, gene edited cell therapy for sickle cell disease, um, siRNA going into the brain and going after neurological diseases. So to me, these are all examples of sentiment has shifted from can this be done to this can be done. And when that starts to happen, you see more investment dollars come in because the venture community works in a way where now all of a sudden you can see innovation happening, new companies being formed, uh, incremental and sometimes gradual, but sometimes uh, significant innovation happening and being built on those breakthroughs. So I, I think those are really positive trends, and you're going to see more investment coming from that. Thank you, John. So we spent a few moments talking about the successes, um, and we've already agreed that there have been many. Uh, the patients, their families, uh, patient advocacy groups, uh, Fortune are still very, very focused on making sure that we keep an eye on, on these things. But there are many headwinds um, uh, to continued success in, in this area. And so I'd like to begin to explore a few of those. I'm going to start off with, with, uh, with the issue of reimbursement and investment in this area. Okay. Um, as more and more therapies arrive in rare and ultra rare diseases, this becomes a continuous issue. It's almost similar to the issue of, of value of pharmaceuticals in general, as we discussed this morning. And, and how, do we, how do we articulate that value better? Jim, I'm going to have you start off, and I'm going to have everybody else chime in. In terms of what you see as a challenge from an a investment perspective in, in, in these areas, where it's, it's, not, it's not for the faint-hearted to, to, to work in. You know, we'll talk about the issues of recruitment, uh, rarity of these disease, of course, et cetera. But Jim? Well, that's one area that I clearly know nothing about. Okay. But, uh, <laughs> but anyway, that won't stop me. <laughs> that's why I asked you. So, <laughs> so, so you know, I, I can say whatever I want. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but, no, and, you know, incredibly uh, s serious issue. So, so before COVID, there was a lot of hand-wringing. Uh, from uh, stakeholders in, in gene therapy. And, and there were two issues that, that uh, were discussed. One was, uh, will payers pay? And then the other one was regulatory uncertainty. Well, at, at least in higher income countries, particularly US, uh, these things are being priced at levels that are shocking. And, and one very positive development uh, uh, has been not only in the United States but outside the United States is, is uh, Peter Marks and Sieber uh, and the leadership and not only Peter but filtering down where, where we are getting engagement and collaboration and innovation and regulatory sciences in a way I never would have dreamed, dreamed of. And so tick those two boxes so we're ready to go but we're not seeing the same kind of support that I would have hoped that we would have seen. So I, I, I'm not exactly sure 
you know, I still think the issue is, um, is uh, how do you price a one-time delivery right. um, with smaller markets? Uh, where, I, where I really see the challenge is XUS, um, and that is uh, in, in middle-income in countries where there's a significant disease burden. And the burden of genetic disease is disproportionately outside the United States. For example, in major parts of North America and Middle East, the, uh, the uh, uh, consanguinity, first cousin marriage is about 70 percent, which leads to loss of function, autosomal rest of disease burden, and many, and many founder effects. And, um, and, and where the payer there is a, um, is a, a near bankrupt public health s system, um, that there's a tremendous amount of concern over whether accessibility uh, for these uh, gene therapies and genetic medicines uh, that, that could literally at, at anywhere near uh, U.S. price would bankrupt these systems. So, so um, I think uh, um, my hope is uh, that Matea is right, that we're in a micro cycle <laughs> and that we're on the way back and investment will come back. But, but the other, one other point about it is, you know, for gene therapy and, and for sure genome editing, such as base editing with gene therapy, this is the ultimate platform where, where you can uh, create commonality in everything but the gene of interest. And you could leverage that commonality to simplify and reduce the cost of drug development. Uh, and, I think, uh, and I think the health authorities are asking us to do that. So I do see that, that there could be successful businesses, but we have to be smarter about how we leverage the platform uh, and, and engage with, uh, with stakeholders to move this forward. Yeah, thank you, Jim. Uh, I was going to ask uh, Ed uh, and Josh to reflect on this issue and how it affects your companies, and then I'm going to ask David how it affects his uh, public company uh, in terms of not only investment uh, of your work, but how large pharma begins to look at you as well. Now, clearly, we have large pharma already quite invested in rare diseases, but I would just like to sort of have a holistic view of how these changes uh, might affect the whole uh, endeavor in, in rare diseases. Well, I'm <coughs> happy, to, happy to start. I think it, it is a challenge, and I think, obviously, we're always trying to figure out um, what do you invest in? What's the next disease you go after? And unfortunately, if you look at the return on that investment, sometimes um, it's, uh, some diseases are, are, are too small from a population to, to really go after. Uh, we were fortunate at Reve for a rare disease. It has enough patients that you can do a clinical trial. Um, but I think one of the challenges is it's, it continues to be a challenge if you look at the duration of trials, especially for rare diseases. And there needs to be a, a little bit more flexibility. You know, we've all listened to Peter Marks, who's been terrific and, and talks about innovation. But unfortunately, that's not through the, the entire rest of the FDA. And one of the challenges, I, I was at a recent meeting, and, and I think there was about 25 CEOs who were all focused on uh, neurologic diseases. And, I, and we, we just, I just asked a poll, I go, how many of you have done a phase one or phase two in the US? There was not one CEO that said yes. And they said, we all go to the UK or to Australia. It's just too hard. Nobody thinks about the risk benefit in these rare lethal diseases. And it's just, it's, it's not cost effective. So then we have to do the studies and then come back to the US. And so we, we need to have a more um, you know, homogeneous system, even throughout the FDA. And that's also true with the EMA and, and, um, and in Japan. To, if we're doing clinical trials, we need to be able to do it quickly. We, you can't do a five-year clinical trial and because of enrollment, and no one can afford it. So we have to figure out how do we do this more efficiently, to Jim's point, and so we can actually get these therapies to patients uh, and do it in a way that people are willing to invest in it because there's a return on that investment. Yeah, thank you. Josh? Um, <clears throat> yeah, so just to comment first um, briefly on the, the point about reimbursement. I mean, on one hand, I think we've been having this discussion about the pricing for, for almost 
couple decades now. And it's not to say it's not real. And in fact, now more than ever, it actually feels like more tangible in the sense of, for example, the IRA, there's some noise. I think people are a little confused about actually some clarity in terms of how that will impact rare diseases and, and modalities. It seems to me it's not completely worked out. Um, <clears throat> you know, on the other hand, the U.S. basically subsidizes the rest of the world if you think about sort of drug pricing. And, and if the U.S. starts clamping down on that a little bit, um, I think the point's well taken that the ex-U.S. countries are not necessarily going to come up with a difference on the revenue. So, so those are challenges. Um, I continue to believe that if you are working on a disease where there's a high unmet need and you develop a transformative therapy that is disease modifying, um, I guess there's, that's somewhat subjective too, but if we just agree that it's something that changes the lives of patients, um, that it, I think investors do believe that, you know, that is, there is a, a strong belief that you will get pricing for that and support that. Then I think it goes back to Ed's question, which is, you know, it becomes an equation of how efficiently and um, quickly, quite frankly, can you get that to the market? And, and so in some cases when there's, for example, a lot of these rare diseases, you don't know the endpoints. You, and, and you really need a lot of interaction with regulatory agencies to work that out and be creative. That has happened in ALS in some places. So if we can take that model and apply it to other rare diseases, that's going to be very helpful as well. We'll get back to that in terms of how difficult or how easy it is to develop any of these drugs. Because my, my own view is that I don't care what kind of drug you're developing, it's difficult, um, uh, rare uh, or for a larger population. So David, uh, could you just give us your reflections uh, from the point of view of your own company, but from um, large pharma in terms of looking at rare diseases as an opportunity? Um, you know, you know, we, we've gone, we, cancer is now in many ways sort of very focused uh, uh, disease state and we, we can have very focused therapies and same thing with, with rare diseases. But, you know, is, is that as favorable kind of uh, investment for, uh, for, for large pharma as well? Um, your view, you've been in both, so. Yeah, um, maybe I'll just back up just a, a bit here. Um, <clears throat> so. I'm going to use the Genzyme example again. Uh, when the orphan drug legislation was written, uh, everybody felt that was transformative legislation, which it was, um, incentives for developing rare diseases and the like. Um, and if you look at the numbers, it drove innovation and it drove investment in rare diseases. But I will argue um, that was a much smaller event um, as compared to when Henry Tamir, um, CEO of Genzyme, founder, priced the first rare disease, and he priced it at $400,000 a year for a treatment, which was just unfathomable at that time. This was back in the mid-90s, and if you're around and were paying attention at that time, it got, of course, enormous amount of debate. He ended up in front of Congress, opening up the books, explaining sort of how this whole rare disease paradigm works. And it's not that everybody accepted it, but it worked. And because it worked, and because there was a business model, that drove, because suddenly people were saying, oh my god, well, if you can charge $400,000 a year for a drug, then a small disease can work, and then I am willing to put the investment in the like. And so it set sort of the bar for where we were, number one. Number two, in the beginning, our prices outside the U.S. were higher than inside the U.S. Now, why is that? Actually, it turns out in countries outside the U.S., there's this principle of solidarity, which is much deeper, more profound certainly than it is here in the U.S., and the right of patients to be treated and the willingness of healthcare systems to treat. And so when we were having those discussions with countries outside the U.S., it was one of partnership. It was like, look, we've got a shared you know, problem here. You've got patients who need treatment. We have a potential solution. Let's figure out how we can do this. And we're sitting essentially on the same side of the table. Now, fast forward to where we are today, and I do have a rare disease, and we are in African negotiations around the world. Um, I can tell you the landscape has changed dramatically. And it's not that the, the concept of wanting to work together, and as Josh is recognizing, you've got a potentially transformative therapy that's important, we have to find a way to get it, make it available. It's a little bit like the Peter Marks example. If you can find the Peter Marks in the system in your equation, you're good. Unfortunately, they're proportionally small in number, and you're more likely to be sitting across from somebody who's not oriented that way, and it is increasingly transactional, and it's transactional with people who don't understand the problem you're trying to help. And when it becomes that, it's just a numbers game. 
It's just, you know, how big a discount, it's reference pricing, and it's just this eternal squeeze, and we see it now migrating to the U.S., and increasingly the U.S. is going to be drafting off of the transactional mindset of people outside the U.S., and so the real threat to rare diseases right now, it's not science, because Jim said science is better than another, and good news about science is the rules are fixed. You just follow it, science, you know, it tells you yes, no, yes, no, sooner or later the truth is fixed. The regulatory equation is not fixed. It's a function of the Peter Marks of the world, and the market access question is not fixed. It's a function, again, of who you're sitting across from and how this And these systems are incredibly stressed. So it's not that they're wrong to be transactional. It's not that they're just bad people. But we're in an incredibly challenging world where the people we're across the table from don't have the same mindset that we did in the beginning. So, so that's a great <clears throat> transition to this issue of the regulatory headwinds uh, and the understanding or not, you know, of Peter Marx or not uh, in, in this area. Um, Priya, uh, I was going to ask you about your, your uh, thoughts about that. Um, um, you know, what, what is the FDA sort of doing about this, the issues of biomarkers? Do we have enough of those? Uh, we'll talk about patients too, you know, obviously it's rare disease, not many patients. So how do we identify those patients who might be benefited from, from this? Yes, I think that is at the heart of this issue. Because even when I think about the investment and the value proposition, it has to be a balance. And I think if it's just left to a bunch of companies to figure out everything about that rare population and then come out with a product and then prove everything and put it on a platter, that's not going to work in our society or world. So we need far more investment from a public-private partnership perspective in natural history, biomarker development, and endpoints. And if we can't get those three things lined up, we don't have too many incentives to do all of that, and neither do we have the capacity. And I'll give you one example. Uh, one example is really the neurofilament, which in 2023 uh, at Biogen, you know, we were able to take forward in the context of the person for SOD1 ALS, which is 2% of all ALS. So really a rare genetic form of ALS. We would have left to a person which today we hear stories every day on how it's changing people's lives. We would have left that drug behind on the table because we wouldn't have had neurofilament to make the case. And it's only because of the ecosystem, because we couldn't do this on our own. There was a lot of data in the public domain. There was a lot of literature that was converging in the same direction that told us that yes, neurofilament was going to be important, it was going to be important for two things, assessing heterogeneity of disease and also predicting prognosis. So it's a very unusual biomarker, but boy, was that really critical for us because we were able to demonstrate that, it, that the drug definitely impacted neurofilament levels significantly and then downstream of that translated into clinical benefit. But again, Without that investment of the ecosystem, the academic centers, so many players coming in, it was not possible. So I feel that, and that was the way we were able to make the case to FDA. My personal example with the FDA has actually been really stellar. They ask exceptionally good questions, they get to the heart of the matter, and they try to be very objective. But you've got to have objective data to share with them. It's not just an opinion. And the, the place where it can also help us is not having placebo-controlled studies in rare diseases, which would be a huge move forward. If we had an independent objective biomarker and we had an endpoint. So I think that two, two thoughts I'll leave you with on this. I think there are two partnerships that have been very valuable to us at Biogen. One has been the uh, FinGen partnership in Finland, where we've got 500,000 patients. You can call them back, you can look at a lot of data, and it's collected in a natural history format. And the other is that Our Future Health in the, the UK, where it's, they aim to collect 10% of the population with the potential to recall for clinical trials and data. 
And these types of partnerships, sadly, I don't see them across the board in the United States. And that would be an area that I think we need more investment. Thank you, Priya. Ed, I want you to add to this conversation and talk about uh, your thoughts about regulatory. And, and you made comments about, you already made comments about most of these studies are often started in the UK now. And, and uh, just, just reflect on that for us. And then uh, I want people to be putting their thinking caps on and we can ask uh, and, and try to answer a few questions from the audience. Yeah, I think it's, um, uh, it is interesting. And I think the, some of the challenges is for a lot of the rare diseases is that we always think of a double-blind placebo-controlled trial. And that is absolutely the gold standard. I don't disagree at all. But what we've heard is it's not always that easy to do. And I think one of the things um, um, that, is, that I, we found very, very important for a lot of diseases is if you look at the medical literature and you try to understand the natural history, frequently I think it's urban legend. Uh, and until you actually do a natural history study. And, and there is, as an example, so we were told that um, in Dravé syndrome, the seizures, as they get older, just burn out. That was a term they used. It burns out. It's not true. Well, when we did the natural history study, we suddenly realized that the seizures never get better. They continue, even in an adult. So, you, so, okay, that's important. And then we also realized that um, what's the trajectory of the cognition and behavior. Nobody had ever studied that. And those are the kind of things that have to be done before. And, you know, so, so and sometimes the, um, like in Friedrich's ataxia that Priya mentioned, they did a beautiful natural history study, and that was very important to the approval of that drug for Friedrich's ataxia. But a lot of times there are none. One of the things that I think can also be helpful is we were sitting in an in a, uh, American Epilepsy Society, and we had two competing co uh, companies, Encoded and us, and we had natural history studies. And we looked at the natural history studies and they were absolutely superimposable. And then, so the two CEOs got together and we said, uh, we might get killed suggesting this, but why don't we put the data together in a publication? And then we went back to our teams and they said, yeah, that's a great idea. And so we're actually sharing data and learning from each other because it's very expensive. I think the other thing that, that we need to learn is one of the challenges with genetic diseases is it's costly to do the genetic testing to find the patients, and reimbursement is a challenge. So we, we did this with um, uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, and we did this for epilepsy, um, and it was actually BioMarin started it, and I uh, talked to BioMarin, and I said, well, we're happy to, to share in the cost to do genetic testing, and then Ovid came in, and then Coded, and all the other companies. We could have never afforded to do it but when all the companies, you know, basically this was a, a, a safe space where everybody could collaborate and work together. And, and we learned so much about the epidemiology. In fact, our next disease indication, we had not considered, but when we realized how frequent it was based on the genetic testing, we decided to go after it. And so these are the kind of things that we can do. But I think one thing that could be very important, if you have really good natural history data, uh, and, and I think, you know, Riata showed that very nicely, I think that is not unreasonable. Um, and, and David remembers when we worked on myozyme, um, you know, this was a fatal disease. All the children died by the time uh, they were, uh, by 18 months of age, they were, they were you know, only 1% of the population was alive. And what we were able to do is use that natural history because we felt it was unethical to do a control trial. And that was the decision. But that is the rarity. I think every time you mention that, you know, I think to regulatory authorities, they start to twitch. Uh, and they say, oh, you can't do that. But I think if you really understand the natural history, and again, with good studies, and, and maybe studies that companies share, um, you know, why can't we use that? Because that does reduce your, your, your time element in, yeah. in, in doing these studies. Um, Josh, one, one last comment about regulatory from you, because you've, you've talked about um, the interactions with the agency in terms of uh, how valuable um, or not sometimes these f more frequent interactions could help a company like yours and, and others uh, move along, whether you're talking about yep. historical controls or study design when you don't have, yep. the, the end is, is small. So. Yeah, I mean, I'll just give a little vignette. And um, so 
we are in the clinic uh, for a rare disease called urea cycle disorders, and we started that because we actually wanted to go into healthy volunteers to start for a variety of different reasons, including we're using a PD marker, and this goes back to the biomarker point. Um, the observation that, that we have had, interestingly, is interacting with the FDA to actually get that into the clinic in the health it has been extraordinarily inefficient. Um, just the way that process goes, quite frankly, and the way the feedback goes. It, it's few and far between, and you have to do a ton of prep work, and then sometimes you don't even get answers to the questions. Um, on the other hand, I do want to say, it's not to speak badly the FDA, that I think when you're in the clinic and have data, it, there's, there's some good processes in place, and I think it works much better. Flip that around, um, we're in Australia, that is a completely different set of interactions. It's been a very collaborative set of discussions. There's been frequent back and forth. Um, we were able to, I think, move quickly and actually make changes and do things that were in the best possible way for, for people, patients, and the drug. And so it's not to say Australia has it all figured out. I think that they have, you know, everybody has their own uh, benefits and flaws. But that type of interaction, especially for small companies too, right? Just by sitting around and talking, you know, we're burning cash. Um, our cost of capital is extremely high. Time is extremely valuable for us. And so I do think that's why you're seeing a lot of these genetic companies, and I put gene editing and I put oligos and siRNA in this category, you're seeing them all start XUS. And there's a very strong reason for why that is. And I think part of it is a bit deliberate by the FDA to, to risk apportionment in terms of where they want the first things done. And, and I think that's important to, to think about. Thank you, Josh. Are there any questions from, from the audience? Yes, please stand up and identify yourself. Microphone, thank you. It's a T-Rex cell therapy company. I have a question for you, Priya. Uh, in terms of uh, you know the great progress that Biogen has done in neurofilament, in terms of as a company, you know, do you have any plans for a matrix of biomarkers that will supplement neurofilament, especially with the recent data of rapamycin in the placebo control trial, where placebo um, actually showed neurofilament going down? And my, I have another question, which is for the whole panel that for rare diseases, just like in oncology, is there a path for accelerated approval based on phase two contingent upon a phase three follow-up? Thanks. Uh, great, great question. Yes. I can definitely tell you that um, we are never just looking at neurofilament. So what we've learned from failed trials and positive trials is what will it take to, what, what's the quantitative reduction of neurofilament we need to see in a particular disease that will give us confidence. And based on that, we define go-no-go -no -go criteria and gray zones where we need to do more to assess. The other thing I'll say is never just one uh, biomarker. It's really a trend across primary, secondary endpoints, mostly clinical, as well as a host of other biomarkers. So this is really important, and you know you have to be able to demonstrate it. That because it, remember it's only a surrogate biomarker, so it's reasonably likely to uh, predict clinical benefit. It's not a validated biomarker where you would be sure of clinical benefit. Just like for example, blood pressure and heart disease. That's really validated. This is, we're still in the realm of surrogate biomarkers. So there's a lot more work to be done, but it's a breakthrough uh, through the glass ceiling where we believe it is important because it does reflect neuronal degeneration. And if you can really stop that, what does that mean for the patient? It's possible that at a later stage in disease, it actually does not inform clinical benefit because it's too late. So there's many things yet to be discovered, but we believe it's an important way forward. Priya, thank you. Uh, we're at the end of the session. There is one hand up there. That hand's been up for a long time. We're going to take that question. So who has a microphone for that gentleman? Thank you. Uh, so Priya, thank you so much for all those insights. Uh, I, I would like for you to comment not just on the, on the fact that the data have been collected, but the data and analytics platform that allowed uh, the company to access the data that we provided. And then the second piece, the, uh, I was part of the advisory committee for Tofersen, and one thing that I, that I want to make sure is understood is that for that advisory committee, the FDA did a beautiful job 
defining the questions because the questions drive a lot of things about getting the right answers. So if, I wonder if you can comment on both those two things. Yes, the analytics are critical. The validity of the assay, the noise level, making sure that you're really looking across all of that and it's not an outlier. It's not being driven, especially in the rare trials, it's not being driven by two or three patients who may have a spurious result. So all of that is very critical. Thank you for calling that out. And I agree completely in an advisory committee setting, the questions are critical. And we've been on all sides of that here at Biogen. So totally agree. I think uh, it was a very objective discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Priya. Where does the time go? Uh, before we thank the, uh, the panel, um, we cover a lot of ground, actually. We talked about all the exciting advances uh, that are going on, but indeed all the challenges that still face this, uh, this part of our, our industry, which I, I think for those patients and their families um, really mean everything in terms of how we keep the pressure on to be able to make that, that happen, you know, from, from the investment uh, aspects to regulatory to historical uh, data and, and use uh, to have better biomarkers, have the FDA understand uh, further how you run trials when the N is very small. Um, ultimately, I guess my hope is that we all learn from the experience in rare and ultra rare diseases uh, how to develop drugs without having, you know, 100,000 patients or 10,000 patients. Uh, because it, in many ways, the, the paradigm is not all that different, and maybe that's something to be taken. So uh, join me, uh, all of you. Uh, thank the panel for, for a really excellent discussion today. <laughs>